folks, and let's start out with one of my most favorite hymns. I'm sure that's not proper English, but it is still one of my most favorite. Hymn number 587. Hymn number 587, Victory in Jesus. Once you find that, would you go ahead and stand with me here tonight? And uh, let's go ahead and sing out nice and loud here. sins, uh, but we can now live a victorious Christian life of pleasing God on a day-to-day -day basis. What an amazing, amazing fact that is. So let's think about that as we've seen on that third verse. I heard about a man victory at Amen. all. I don't even deserve it, but he gave me the victory, and it's a very serious battle going on out there, a battle for our souls, hanging in the balance, heaven or hell, and he gave me the victory, and I'm on my way to heaven, praise God, and he gives me the victory every day. Amen. What a rejoicing that we can have. Great to have you out tonight, and it's getting dark, it's, it's been dark now, but just a few more weeks, it's going to be light out at this time. And uh, headed towards spring. Did you enjoy the nice spring weather today? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, go barefoot and wash the car in this beautiful warm sunshine? No, not, not quite spring yet. Not quite. But we're getting there. That day will be coming. 
<laughs> real soon, and we thank the Lord for it. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful evening that we can be together. And Lord, as we gather around your word, we pray that you teach us wonderful truths. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the love that we share among each other, but through the bond of the Spirit. And we pray that you would help us as we sing and share praises. And Lord, help us to be a people that is uh, able to pray and see you do bring the victory and the grace. And we give you praise and glory uh, while we have our being. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, flip over to 566, 566. We'll sing when the roll is called up yonder. Be thinking about some praises and testimonies or maybe a favorite hymn that you'd like sung tonight. And uh, let's start out here with hymn number 566. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the same never shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead and Christ arise and the glory of his resurrection share, when his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies, the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn to setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Till all of life is over and our work on earth is done. The roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Amen. What a great thought. Aren't you looking forward to that day? can't wait. All right, well, how about some uh, testimonies here uh, tonight, or maybe a favorite hymn? We do have, like we do uh, normally, I'm going to ask Brother Joe, maybe he can come grab this mic here. Brother Dad. Brother, brother Dad. <laughs> might, need to, uh, might need to put some batteries in that. I think that one just died there on us. So, uh, uh, when if you get that going, we will uh, we will get one here. If you got a testimony, just raise your hand. That way we can get the mic to you again. That way those online can hear what you're saying. If you just have a uh, have a hymn, just shout that one out to me. Got a testimony, Miss Nancy? Just go ahead and give it while they're working on the mic. You can do it first. I would like some prayers because I'm I'm supposed to go to uh, Florida for seven days, but I get really anxious getting on the plane. Okay. Sometimes I don't go. <laughs> I want to that I I want to go this time. Okay. So I have good things of prayer. All right, let's pray for Miss Nancy. Brother Kevin. I uh, just have a phrase my dad had open heart surgery this past Monday and the surgery went really, really smooth. His recovery was uh, very, at least brief in the hospital. He was able to go home uh, Thursday, very early afternoon. Wow. And uh, his recovery so far is going very well. So it's just been a huge, huge blessing. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord for that. Yes, ma'am. Pray for Miss Julie. Yes, ma'am. I just want to praise the Lord for enabling us to be here tonight. Amen. I want to thank God for my husband and taking good care of the boys at Christ and Christ and Christ. Amen. It's great to see you here tonight, Miss Jenny. 
Yes, sir. came out of surgery just fine. Yeah, amen. And it was great stress on us, knowing that she, when she came through, was, we were all happy for that. And can we sing hymn 20? Hymn number what? 20. 20, hymn number 20, absolutely. Praise him, praise him, great hymn here tonight. <laughs> 20. Two zero. We'll start on that first verse, and we'll see see where we go from there. Phone is working, so if you got a testimony, let's just. After my papa passed away in November, my nana has been worried about finances because he brought in a lot of the money, um, and he has provided for her twice. Mm, he amen. provided for her with a. Um, they found a. Uh, what's it called? Life insurance policy that had been collecting over the years, and she just sold uh, his handicap van. Uh, today, so Amen. that is sold. Amen. Praise the Lord for his provision. Yes, sir. Hymn number 129. Hymn number 129. 129. <laughs> Jesus loves me. Is this a little different tune? Let's see if we, is this the one you were wanting? You want the normal tune? 648, let's see here. Six, 628, you're close. I was like, I ran out of numbers around 630, so. 628.
Amen. How about another testimony here? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, this morning after the message, before it was over, the Lord, this morning when he was asking for praise or for prayer, you know, I always, I said unspoken request, but then I thought, no, and you also say, God has been good. Oh. Okay. And that song this morning that Amanda sang, that was a blessing. Okay, so if I can get through this, but I just want to praise his name because God is so good all the time because it's when the problems come in, yeah, you know, I just don't see how people can make it without God because I just, Amen. I can call him any time. I mean, just like, just for an example, in the classroom, our schools, our agency is going through a change and... Um, <coughs> residential staff, some of the ones on my shift, and they set the environment, these boys, when, before I come into the classroom, and some of them I just have to say, okay, Lord, it's those same staff that are coming in here. You gotta help me. Help me have peace. And uh, I just have to say this week, he's helped me with that, because the last two days, they're cutting back hours, so that I had to have all the boys, because we only had 13. Two's left now, so now we're down to 11. But um, it's gradually coming back in, but um, the Lord has helped me on that part too, and just remaining strong in the Lord and in the, in the power of his might. Amen. Um, I just claimed those verses, because I know I had some verses here, and I won't read them all, but it's over in Ephesians, um, talking about, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, because we're not in a battle with flesh and blood, but we're in a battle with World, <laughs> yeah, spiritual warfare. Yes, yes thank you. Amen. Um, and I just, I just have to give him glory and just continue praying for me. I love you. Amen. We will praise the Lord for that. We'll continue to pray as they're going through that transition. Miss Nancy. Six twenty-five. Six twenty-five. She's gonna get them all in here. She wanted the whole melody. All right, we can do this one. And 625, and then we'll take our offering here today. Isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? Eyes have seen, ears have heard, it's recorded in God's Word. Isn't Jesus, my Lord? Wonderful, wonderful Jesus is to me. Counselor, Prince of Peace, mighty God is he. Saving me, keeping me from all sin and shame. Wonderful is my Redeemer, praise his name. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name.
of your favorites in there. And that one is extremely hard to lead back to back. I'm just letting you know that. So, Brother Joe. I am just so grateful for the Word of God and how practical it is to our lives. And uh, even as I was, uh, you know, we go through trouble sometimes and we think about, um, we can get consumed with those problems and even get to the point of thinking, you know, woe is me, I'm going through this. But as I was reading through Genesis again this morning and how Joseph, as he reveals himself to his brothers who sold him into captivity and he had spent 20 plus years in Egypt now and all of the work and he had the opportunity through the prisons and everything else to get extremely bitter against God or to turn his back on God completely and even when it came to the point to where when his brothers are like uh oh it's Joseph he did not chastise them. He did not condemn them. But he just relayed to them a truth. He says, God brought me here hmm. yeah. to preserve you. Yeah. Amen. And it's like, wow. You know, what a perspective. And so many times we think that we have it so rough, but yet it's all about perspective. When we look at it through God's view and through his lens, it really changes the way in which we should even think about it. So I praise the Lord for his word. It reminds us, you know, Amen. God's got it all figured out. Amen. There's not a mistake. He never makes mistakes. And he always has our best interest at heart. So Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. At this time, I think we're going to go ahead and have our guys. If you would start making your way forward. Um, if you'll take a look at your bulletin, there's a couple of big events in there. I'm not going to go over them here tonight. You can look in there yourself. Uh, parents, just look at the calendar for the upcoming teen events um, for those that are coming up close. And uh, again, if you are interested on that March, I believe it's the 20, 29th. I could be wrong on that date. It's that uh, one-day missions trip. can't remember the exact date. It's a Thursday, all right? If you're interested in that, 29th, I was right. So, all right. So, if you're interested in that... Uh, make sure you come talk to me so that we can do some planning as we get closer to that date. All right, quick update. Tallying up for our Missions Faith Promise is, uh, as of this morning, is uh, 1990. So we're just under 2,000. Our goal, 2,600. And uh, if you have a Faith Promise slip to drive, someone dropped one in the plate already there. Uh, we are excited about seeing us be able to do more missions work this year. So let's continue to be in prayer for that. Also, let's be in prayer for Brother Joe Willis. Now, I can call him Brother Joe. And <laughs> so, but he is, as I mentioned in church this morning, he's headed up to Washington this week. And we need to bathe him in prayer. We put the Lord's anointing on him. It is a spiritual warfare against religious expression in our military. And we need to uh, preserve the freedoms that we have and that God's word can go forward, and it's a special time, special meeting happening this week. We'll be praying for Brother Joe. All right, Joel, would you lead us in prayer? So, Lord, we thank you so much for your wonderful blessings. I thank you for allowing us to gather here with like-minded believers, Lord, just to fellowship with each other and to hear your word, Lord, and sing praises to you. Right now, Lord, I do ask that you bless the offering that's about to be taken, Lord. I ask that it be used for your honor and for your glory, and I ask that you bless the message to follow. I ask these things in your precious name.
take our hymn book out one last time. Let's flip over to hymn number 160. Hymn number 160. We'll sing just one verse of this. My Jesus, I love thee. Hymn number 160, and I'll let you stay seated for this one. Kids can all be dismissed in the back to head back there with Miss Becky with the program she's got. All right. Great. Let's take our Bible. Much thanks and praise to the Lord for how he conducted this morning's service. I'm so thankful. The selection of the music and the special that was sung ministered to hearts. And also the passage of scripture that we looked at. I think the Lord has something special regarding that special need that we discussed. I was on my way out of the building this morning after the service, and my eye fell down on a children's Sunday school paper that was lying on the table, and it was called Hannah Prays for a Son. And so these take-home sheets are for moms and dads to read to their children and to uh, have uh, for their kids, and I think, some, I think the Lord's trying to get a point across, amen? amen. Something about praying and uh, seeing God answer prayer. Let's shift gears and let's go back to what we had started on our series. I'm more excited about this than most, I think. It's just, I love God's Word. This is intensely practical. This is right where we live because we are engaged in spiritual warfare. And if we can understand the tactics of our enemy, we can be better prepared. Amen. And we don't have to be walking along and get caught off guard and continue to fall. God has equipped us and He has given us the instruction manual, the training manual. And so when we learn these things, God can help us. If you haven't been here for this Sunday night series called Hook, Line, and Sinker, it's not every single Sunday night, but it's dispersed in between other special events, then uh, go back and review. It's, It's some great stuff that God's given us here in His Word. And we're doing our third in this series tonight of hook, line, and sinker. And at first, we started out understanding that the devil is a roaring lion going about seeking whom he may devour. He is actively, aggressively looking for the weak one in which he can devour, and that's us. He is seeking to bring us down. Now, we looked at where does he attack? It's not always a physical thing like the... A charismatic preacher that says this, he sent you the demon of the backache or the demon of the, the uh, eye, eye problems or the demon of the, the knee. or the you know. No, that's not always the case. His main approach is the battlefield in our mind. And many people begin to fall. That was the first in the series as we deal with that battlefield that are the imaginations of the thoughts of our heart and how they lead us the wrong way. And we need to be prepared spiritually for that. Then the number two in the series was his tactic of divide and conquer. We looked at the military stories from the Old Testament about how the armies were divided in order to be conquered, and and that is a military tactic that Satan uses, and he's using it right now in our families. And families are being fragmented, split up, and divided. And I, I'm, this is very dear to my heart. I have seen individuals 
whose lives have been devoured. And as I look back in retrospect, I see that was a very key factor in that young person's life who is now far from God. And life, their life is totally messed up. And they're in grief and they're tied up with the cords of their sins, as Proverbs says. They're shackled and they find that they can hardly get loose. And that is a tactic of the devil, to divide and conquer. I think of the story of the lady who, um, with her uh, daughter, she had come home from college, and she was there Christmas break, and she was, mom said, let's do the dishes. And so for, uh, the, they went in, they put the plates on the countertop, and, and uh, the daughter said, uh, okay, mom, you want to wash or do you want to dry? And, and uh, mom said, no, just rinse them and put them in the dishwasher. And the daughter said, what? Well, that's great. I go off to college and you fix the dishwasher. All these years, you made me do the dishes. Why didn't you fix the dishwasher? And the mother said, honey, the dishwasher's never been broken. <laughs> that was the time that you and I could talk. Well, I sure wish you'd fix the dishwasher, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, that is a key example of a family that realizes it's important to have bonding throughout the day, every day. Knitting, if you see someone beginning to go aside and be isolated, that is where the devil begins to work. Now, you think about, I think about another man, he, he, and, he and his wife came to church here for a very short time, and I visited them and was befriending them, and, and he said, yeah, we had a problem with my daughter. My teenage daughter was acting up and rebellious, and she argued, and she went off, and she slammed the door to her room, and I walked up there, and I said, honey, that is not your room. That is my room, and you will not slam the door, and she said, through the, he went, and he got a screwdriver and a hammer, and he went, dink, 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 dink. Pulled the hinges off, carried, the garage, carried it out to the garage and put it, and she had no door. And he said, that is my room. You can sleep in there. You can change in the bathroom, but that's my room. And so he was doing something to say, don't isolate yourself. See, it's important. That's one of the first things that people begin to do when they get upset is, I want to be alone. Give me my space. Folks, I have seen several marriages destroyed, and I go and work with them and try to talk with them, and I hear the same thing every time. I need some space. That's isolation. You cannot work on anything. You cannot heal anything with isolation. Isolation pulls you apart, and Satan says, aha, I've got you. And what we talked about that time in that, that message was, we need each other. I need my children to pray for me and to help me. They need me. It's a cooperative effort. And so that is the first one was divide and conquer. The next one tonight will be uh, number three in our series, and that's the Satan's tactic. But let's go ahead and pray and ask for his blessing. Lord, we pray, our Heavenly Father, we ask you that you would guide us into all truth. We thank you for these messages uh, from your word. We pray that you would... Um, Help us. Lord, our hearts are heavy when we think of those who have succumbed to the lies and deceitful tactics of the devil, and they have been devoured. Lord, help that not happen to us, or, nor to our families, to our children. Help us be able to uh, recognize the beginnings of problems and see the fault lines and prepare and intervene. Lord, we pray that you guide us and help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What is the third... Thing about this. What is another one of Satan's tactics? It's simply this. Draw out and capture. Let's look at Psalm 117, uh, for, sorry, 47, 147 and verse 11. I want you to notice that he says here, the Lord takes pleasure in them that fear him and those that hope in his mercy. God is excited and happy and joyful when he gets to take care of those people that are just in honoring and reverencing him. 
And notice verse 12, praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Take note of what specific city, Jerusalem. Praise thy God, O Zion, the city of David. This is Jerusalem. It had walls all around it. And when David moved this capital to Jerusalem, he then made sure he expanded the walls and every succeeding uh, kingdom after that. When they were capable, they increased by building more and more walls because they wanted to protect the citizens that were inside. Notice verse 14. I'm sorry, verse 13. For he hath strengthened, this is God, hath strengthened the bars of the gates. He hath blessed thy children, where? Within thee. I want to share with you a lesson tonight about the walls and the gates. God is basically saying, I'm going to pour out my blessing on those who fear me, who live in their life in accordance with my word, and that are living within the walls. If you choose to be isolated and come out outside, the, you're going to be under attack. The walls are there for our protection, right? Anybody who looks over the wall and sees the enemy <laughs> who is there ready to devour them is going to turn around, and if they have half a brain, they're going to say, praise God for the walls that are protecting us. And I mean, mortars are coming in and the attack and the gunfire and grenades and all that, and we're within the walls. We're protected. Praise God for that. These are there. They are His walls of protection. And folks, God's wall of protection is called His divine creation of authority in our lives. Those are the walls. When we live within the walls of protection, we will live with His blessing and favor in our life. Biblical authority is a protective for fortress. When we accept it, when we appreciate it and consider that it's there for our good. Today's generation basically is taught totally opposite, amen? Authority is there to, to uh, infringe on your joy. They're going to destroy your self-expression. And we see all of that taking place here. The, <clears throat> our young people are taught critical thinking. And in itself, critical thinking is good if you an analytically think. But if it's just critically thinking, like, I don't like their views. I don't like what they did in the 60s. I don't like what they did in the 50s. I don't like what they did in the 20s. And everything is like, oh, that president was terrible. And that, critical, 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 critical. Hey, wait a minute. What would you have done if you were the president during that time? I mean, the whole view of history is skewed critically. And authority, okay, the, the teachers, they have no authority in the classroom. The, the, the principal, he has no authority. The, the police officer, he has no authority. You can do what you want. It's a free country. We're taught there are no absolutes. That was taught way back in 1983 when I was in high school. There was a sign a teacher put on the wall, there are no absolutes. And I thought to myself, that's an absolute statement. <laughs> of course. There's absolutes. And so, I mean, there's all of this that's taking place. We're taught relativism. Everything is relative. What may be truth today may not be truth tomorrow. We're taught that what truth to you is not truth to me. And it's fluid. And what, what is truth for me today may change for how I feel momentarily within an hour. This is totally, totally a messed up way of dealing with what God has established these walls of protection, sometimes referred to by some as the umbrella of protection, that's called biblical authority. Let me share with you very quickly tonight four things about authority. Number one is this. God's design for authority is universal. It's universal. Everywhere you go, there is authority. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11, we'll read the first three verses. Be ye followers of me. <clears throat> even as I also am of Christ. Okay, 1 Corinthians 11. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them unto you. But I would have you know, the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Just in the same way that Jesus Christ 
is God and is no way inferior to God the Father at all. They are co-equal, co-eternal, co-substantial, co-essential. They are equal. However, there is an authority structure that's even in the Godhead displayed for us that Christ answers to the Father. Isn't that amazing? And in the same way within the home, there is no superiority man over woman. They are co-equal. They work together and co-laborers. However, there is this authority structure that God has said that the woman answers to the man and the man answers for the woman. I can't say that. I didn't dictate that. That is God. That's what he said in a capsule right there in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 through 3. He sets up authority. And so you will never live a day in your entire life when you're not required to answer to some form of authority because we are all under authority in some way. The mark of real maturity for a young person is that they do not, it is not in how they can stand up to authority, but how they can bow the knee to authority. That's maturity. Especially when you look at human authority and it tells you something and it's wrong. How do you deal with it? Oh, I'm going to stand up to them. I'm going to put them in their place and show them. Woo! We hear a lot of that today. I can't believe how our police officers are treated. I don't know about you, but when I was a little kid, my dad was like, he's going to get you and throw you in jail. <laughs> Ooh, I was scared to death of the police officer. Still am. Wow. That's, that's real maturity. In, in a, the young person who is sick of authority, you know what they need to do? They just need to move out, find their own place, pay their own rent, answer to their own boss or their landlord, and if they don't like it, join the army. And you're going to find everywhere you go, there's going to be authority. Amen. You're going to have to answer to somebody. That's number one. It's universal. Number two, your earthly authority is not perfect. Maybe I could expand on that. Earthly authority is often not perfect. In the home, you don't have to look far until you find a husband that does not always lead properly, who has failed who has made bad decisions. In our government system, in our justice system, within law enforcement, folks, there's corruption. It's everywhere. It's in high levels. Recently, it's been referred to as the swamp. We want to drain the swamp, right? I think you'll find that it's almost impossible to drain because there's corruption and evil in so many levels to a degree beyond we can even imagine. But it's our authority. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes parents are not right. Sometimes the husband's not right. Sometimes within a church, the leadership is not right. It'll never be perfect. But even though that's true, that does not negate our responsibility to authority. Look at Romans chapter 13 in the first few verses. Romans 13. There's no exceptions given here. Let every soul be subject in submission unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if you do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Now notice in verse 5, wherefore ye must needs be subject. Why, why do you need to be subject? Two, two reasons. Not only for wrath's sake, because he has the handcuffs and can haul you off. That's, not, that, that's a good reason to obey the authority, right? But there's a deeper reason for the Christian. In verse 5, not only for wrath, but also for what? Conscience. You have to live with your conscience. And you obey the authority not simply because you're afraid that they're going to throw you in jail, 
but you obey them because you're going to have to live with your conscience knowing that you've disrespected them, you've disobeyed them, and that's not just for police officers. That's in any authoritative structure that God has created. Did you know he created three institutions? What's the first one he created? The family. Adam and Eve. The second institution he created was what? Government. Genesis chapter 6. So there's government that's established, chapter 6 through 10, with the flood and all that took place. And after the flood, God said, now there's how you conduct and deal with bad behavior. We never had that before. There's the institution of government, that mankind now has the authority to carry out capital punishment and take people to the electric chair or to however you want to do capital punishment. I, I don't believe in the electric chair, by the way. I believe in electric bleachers. Put them all in there and get it done at one time. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But there's government. What's the third one? The local church. Three, three institutions. Three institutions where there is an authority. And we need to reverence that, that God, whether the pastor is right or wrong, and he's human, and it's often not perfect, guess what? There's an authority there yet the same. We need to understand that. Number three, earthly authority is given for protection. It's given for protection. Turn to Ezekiel 22. Remember, I had you look at Jeremiah in the Old Testament today. If you find Jeremiah, keep turning, you'll have... Limitations for a couple chapters, then Ezekiel 22, look at verse 28. Ezekiel 22, 28. Her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them. They're out there saying, Thus saith the Lord, when the Lord hasn't even spoken. The people of the land have used oppression. They've exercised robbery. They have vexed the poor and the needy. They, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. So a lot of evil's going on, and God says, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me in the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Now, what is a hedge? He says, I sought for someone that would at least be man enough to stand up and, st in, and stand in the hedge in that gap. What is a hedge? Well, I often think about, you know, you get out just the shears and the head shears and clippers and, and doing it all by hand. And then I got this power clipper and I could do that when I did lawn care and work that and get it all, do the hedges. And, and I had one in front of my house that died. And so I had hedge, 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 hedge. Well, what do you do? You can't heal it, can't grow it back. You pull it out and then the house looks weird. or like, oh, there's a gap in my hedge. And I'm depressed. I ripped them all out. <laughs> I put in tulips. Now, <clears throat> that's a Valentine flower, by the way. Moving on. <clears throat> You'll get it. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So there's a hedge. What do you do when the enemy is outside the hedge? Now think about this. In World War II, at the invasion of Normandy on D-Day, June 6th, what did a lot of those paratroopers do when they landed behind enemy lines? They found themselves in the fields of Normandy. From the aerial photos, they realized that they could move and they would capture the roads and, and protect the roadways for all the, the invasion forces to come, but they did not see the 3D pictures of the reality of the hedges. The hedges were not little rows of trees. They were actually as high as, even higher than this wall. And so when they landed in the field, they had to get to the road, which was on the other side, after thousands, hundreds and hundreds of years of cultivating and farming that land, they had continued to push dirt up into those areas, and the trees grew and died and, and created more growth area. And at the time of the World War II D-Day invasion, the hedges were very high. Our soldiers had tremendous difficulty getting through what's called the hedgerows, and many died. Now, that's the kind of hedge that God's talking about. The enemy 
is wanting to pour in and infiltrate. God says, is there anybody, anybody who will be the hero, the brave man, that would stand in that gap and stop and hold off the infiltration of the enemy? I looked for someone, and there was none. There were no heroes. That's quite an indictment on all of Israel at this time. The hedge is there for your protection. That's what he's getting across here. Just like we read in Psalm 147, the walls are for our protection. The hedge is there for our protection. The enemy is on the outside and the people on the inside, on the inside they begin to say, why do we have to stay inside this area? I don't like it. I want to explore outside. I want to break through. I want to go on out there. And when you get drawn out, that's when the enemy will get you. Now, number four, authority is a protective gift from God. Turn to Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 1. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. 10 and verse 8. Ecclesiastes 10, 8. Just a warning. The wisest man in the world, Solomon, wrote this book, and he says, Ecclesiastes 10, 8, He that diggeth a pit, why do you dig a pit? To trap somebody, right? And you throw a brush over. We did that when we were kids. That was pretty dumb. Someone could really got hurt, but we were... We'd dig a hole out in the woods, and we'd take limbs off trees, and, and we'd lay them all over that, and we were hoping that some kind of coyote would come and fall in, and we'd catch it, and, and we'd do that. It's dangerous. Here you are, you're trying to entrap somebody, and guess what? You're the one who gets entrapped. But notice verse 8, he says, Whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. You are the one who's trying to break out of the hedge, you're going you're gonna to pay. You see, the hedge is there for your protection. And many times in the Old Testament, especially you read through Song of Solomon in the farms and the gardens, they would plant those hedges with a lot of very prickly type of things that kept people from coming in. Um, I met a man one time, a friend of mine, and he said uh, that he said, I said, what'd you put in for plants around your front yard? He said, I put in guard plants. And I was like, I've never heard of a guard plant. What's a guard plant? And he had gotten some very, very prickly type of plants uh, that uh, he had planted there. So I went over and looked at it. I was like, whoa, those things have razor blades all the way up the sides. They can slice your hand wide open. And he had planted those. Kim, what's the name of that flower that, that blooms? Oh, it's a beautiful white, white plant. I call it the sin plant because it's the most attractive thing in the world. You go, ah, and you want it. And then when you get to it, the, the branches slice your arms open. That's an example of sin, right? It's a good example. I can't think of it after church, it'll come to my mind. Uh, I, I don't like those. <laughs> I don't like weeding around them. Um, they're worse than cacti. Yeah, that you have these hedges. God gives a hedge for our protection to keep the evil out. And when you try to break through the hedge, you're going to be captured. That's, that's the lesson. This is protective. Let me share one passage, and then we'll wrap things up with, a, with one more passage of Scripture. But turn to Hebrews in chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Whenever a young person in the home resists the authority of mom or dad, and they try to go out on their own, disobeying that authority that God put in their life, they have subjected themselves to destruction and capture. That's the truth. Whenever a wife resists the leadership of the husband, that is putting themselves out there, outside the hedge of protection that God will bless. And when you're not under that, that, within that hedge of protection, you've subjected yourself to be captured and devoured. If a man does something outside of God's authority in his life, he also puts himself out there. And within the church, 
Hebrews chapter 13, just look at two verses. Look at verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. The pastor ought to have a, a faith that you can follow in his footsteps, considering the end of their conversation and lifestyle. And so there's, there's this spiritual leadership within the local church. Look at verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you. Submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that's unprofitable for you. Now, pastors, I think, even in my own case, I, I try not to stress these verses because I don't want anyone thinking that pastor's on some kind of power trip. But you all know me well enough to know that that is not my heart's intention. That's not how I follow the Lord's leading for conducting God's flock. I'm here to shepherd God's flock, to feed the lambs. But there is an authoritative structure, and when someone totally disregards that and says, I don't need that, I can walk away, I can leave that church, I can do whatever I want to do. I don't need to join another church and submit to another church and its leadership. I'm on my own. That, my friends, is a family that's totally placing themselves outside the hedges and is open to the devil's attack. I've seen it over and over again. There's not a respect for local church authority in most churches these days. And it's true. And I'm not... I'm not using these scriptures to try to establish some kind of fake authority or power trip at all, but I'm just warning us that there's very little respect for God's systems of authority these days. Number one, it's universal. Number two, authority is often not perfect. Number three, it's given for protection. And number four, it's a gift. Turn to one last page. Turn to Judges chapter 20. If you're a young person and you're living in the home under mom and dad's authority, understand that they are, that authority is there from God. And when we resist that authority, like a rebel, guess what? You're outside the hedge of protection and God will judge. Be careful. But in Judges chapter 20, God gives us a whole story about this, an example we have a battle that's taking place here, and I won't go into the whole story because it's quite long. It's about how the people of Gibeah resisted all the rest of the children of Israel. And uh, the children of Israel said, you need to do this to, to the city of Gibeah. And they said, no way, Jose, we're going to fight you. And so Judges chapter 20, we'll skip all the way to the end of the story in verse 30. And the children of Israel went up against the children of Benjamin, that's one of the tribes, on the third day, put themselves in array all their formations of their armies together against Gibeah as at other times. And the children of Benjamin that were inside the city of Gibeah went out against the people and were drawn away from the city. And they began to smite of the people and kill as at other times in the highways of which one goeth up to the house of God and the other to Gibeah in the field about 30 men of Israel. So they're in battle and, and here's what Israel did. Israel, all the other 11 tribes that were there in battle said, you know what? The only way we're going to get them and conquer them is to lure them outside their city walls. And so they walked down the main road, the highway there that was leading up toward Shiloh the, and, and where the, temp, the tabernacle of God was. And, and they got them out on this highway and 30 Israelite soldiers fell in battle. They were killed. And the children of Benjamin said, yes, we're conquering. And they gained confidence. Things were going good. Everything's great. They're moving along. And let's attack. And they left the city. And they're out conquering. Verse 32. And the children of Benjamin said, they are smitten down before us as at the first. But the children of Israel said, hmm, let us flee and draw them away from the city into the highways. And all the men of Israel rose up out of their place and put themselves in array at Baal Tamar. And the liars in wait of Israel came forth out of their places, even out of the meadows of Gibeah. And there came against Gibeah 10,000 chosen men out of all Israel. And the battle was sore, but they knew not that evil was near them. To summarize this, if you were to read further on down, you will see that the children of Benjamin who resisted the authority and leadership of Israel and said, we're going to live our own life. They turned around and they saw that all the liars in wait, meaning those people that were hiding in the bushes in their ghillie suits, for you soldiers that know that, 
They, they rose up out of the fields and they were surrounded and they looked back and Israel had already entered the city and lit it on fire and burned it to the ground. They were in, captured, they were encircled, they were slaughtered. That is a military tactic to lure out and capture that we know in our military and Satan uses it too. The first one is that hook that he sets, which is to isolate someone. The second one is to draw you out from the walls of authority. If there is within your heart an inkling at all of resisting in anger and bitterness toward authority in your life, young person toward mom or dad, wife to the husband, husband to his boss, in any way, you have been drawn out of the hedge of protection. You will find, you'll find great safety placing yourself within the walls. That's the lesson. Don't let Satan get a foothold. Don't let him draw you out. And <clears throat> don't let him begin to allow rebelliousness in your heart, in your spirit. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would guide us continually. And this week, as we face spiritual warfare, we're going to come up against issues of authority. Help us to have the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself unto him that judges righteously. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to do that in all the positions that we are in, in the home, in work, even in the church, whatever it may be, Lord, help us to follow your example and submit to authority insofar, Lord, that it's within your word, of course. But we pray in all these areas that we struggle, that we resist authority, help us to understand that you have designed it for our good and for our safety. We pray for your blessing now. Lord, bless our church. And Lord, I pray that you would be with those who couldn't be here tonight. Lord, I miss them. Bring them back. Lord, if they've grown cold in their heart and their life, I ask that you'd convict them and show them that they need to be with the church family and growing in your word. I pray that you'd do great things with Cross and Crown this year. Father, I pray for our teens and our youth, Lord, that they would not just be good kids, but they'd be godly young people. Father, I pray that you would help us to reach a goal for our mission's promise. We pray that you would help us to do more, even more each year. Lord, we pray that you would sell our buildings. We pray that you would help us in your timing to be able to get a new building, to be able to reach more of Clarksville, more classrooms, more teaching, more work of God going on throughout the week. God, we pray that you would be in, in control of all of that, Lord, and that you would provide for us with, uh, with finances, Lord, that you would provide and meet the needs in, in, in that way, that you'd protect us from the work of the devil. God, we pray that you would uh, that you would send power from on high in, in all the, the teaching and preaching of your word. God, we pray that it would be heaven on earth. Lord, keep us humble. Keep us surrendered in love to each other. Keep bitter spirits out and away. And we pray that you would help us to have a unified spirit within our church, Lord. We thank you for the, the great peace we've enjoyed for so many years with, with unity. And we thank you, Lord. We do pray that you would... <clears throat> Uh, just help us to see more souls saved, and lives changed, and decisions made. We pray that you would, would bless. In Jesus' precious name, amen. God bless.